All right, so as I've said, we come to the end of Galatians this morning. Let me read for you the concluding verses, verses 11 through 18 of chapter 6. So Paul writes this, again, remembering that these are not Paul's ideas. You know, it's interesting that Jonathan Edwards, when he was uh, talking about inspiration, that it, it's something he believes that the authors themselves experienced, uh, that they knew that they were writing Scripture. And the way that they knew was that they, they sensed God's joy and they saw His glory in what, what they were writing and experienced, you might say, to a, a greater degree what it is that we as believers experience when we read the Bible, okay? That's what we're actually going to be looking at this evening. That, that is the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit that convinces us that the Bible is God's Word. When we read this, we see something different than what we read in the works of Shakespeare or whatever <laughs> other, other work we might read uh, that's been written in this world. So this is what Paul writes by the inspiration of the Spirit. He says, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. But may it, may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our um, edification this morning. Now, remember, last week, Paul called us to invest ourselves in God's kingdom, to use the gifts and the time and the resources that God has given us to promote his work, to support the worship and the mission of his church, you know, the Great Commission, in caring for and building up his people, and in serving our neighbor. And again, remember, our goal is to fulfill that commission, that great commission. Uh, maybe you noticed in my prayer that I was making reference to it, to make the invisible kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ visible by being living examples of what it is He calls us to be and communicating His gospel to others, praying at the same time that He would use our efforts to bring more and more people to submit to Him in loving obedience to the Father and love to one another. I mean, that, that's really what the kingdom of Christ is all about, isn't it? It's to love and worship God, put Him first, and to love your neighbor. That is what will bring peace into the world when everyone is obeying Christ. Of course, they're not all going to do that willingly except as God converts them. And of course, again, if he brings revival, it's been shown historically that the influence of the Spirit can also bring about this willing subjection, although not out of love if they're not converted. So again, depending upon how we view what Scripture is saying is going to take place in the future, it appears as though Christ is telling us that we should be praying that such a kingdom would grow, expand, and eventually fill the earth. Now, Paul said to accomplish this, we need to sow to the Spirit. Let's not forget the key. To use the means that He has given to us to become spiritually strong. That's what we're doing this morning, using the means of grace. And we need to be doing that throughout the week, spending time with the Lord, communing with Him. And at the same time, we need to stop sowing to our flesh, okay? doing the things that strengthens it, rather than putting it to death. Paul says, if we faithfully sow to the Spirit, we will become spiritually stronger. And as we become spiritually stronger, we will serve Him more consistently. You know, more often we'll, we'll lay ourselves out more 
And so, he said, we'll receive a greater reward on that final day. Remembering again that whatever we accumulate in this world, you know, whatever we have to enjoy here, we have to leave behind, don't we, when we leave this world. The only things that we actually get to keep forever are the things we do for the Lord, the things we give to Him. And those things we get to keep and enjoy forever. So that's where Jesus says we should be investing and laying up our treasures rather than in the things of the world. And the way we do that is by sowing to the Spirit. And so Paul told us not to become discouraged. Sometimes we can be discouraged when we don't really see any fruit out of our efforts. They don't seem to be amounting to much. But he says we will reap if we don't grow weary. God gives times. He gives seasons of plenty. Times, you know, where, hey, it seems like what we're doing is really paying off. You know, it's really bearing fruit. And other times where it seems like it's just wasted effort. But the Lord says again through Paul, we will reap if we don't grow weary, so let's be encouraged to do that. Now at this point in his letter, Paul takes the pen from his amanuensis, perhaps you've heard that word before, it's the term used for a scribe that would be like a secretary who would write the letter for, he, for him, you know. You ever notice sometimes it seems like Paul suddenly, you know, it seems like Paul's speaking throughout the entire letter and then Paul says now, now I, Paul, send this greeting to you. And it's almost like, oh, wait a minute, who was speaking before? Well, it was Paul, but he was using the secretary. And at certain points, usually towards the end of his letter, he takes up the pen and begins to write. And that's what he does here in, in this passage this morning. He takes the pen from his secretary, and instead of writing his customary farewell greetings, you know, say, send my greetings to so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so and then giving his closing benediction, he finishes the letter by giving a summary of his main point. When all is said and done, what matters is what God has done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what we are to rejoice in, and we are to let that joy and rejoicing motivate us to give ourselves to Him. Now, I said Paul personally wrote this conclusion. The Galatians, as they received the original, you know, autograph, you know, the original letter, would be able to see that there was a shift in the way the letter is being written at this particular point, a change in the style. He says in verse 11, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Now, some believe that he was referring to the length of his letter. You know, I've written you a very lengthy letter, but it's really not that long when you compare it to other letters like Romans or 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Um, he's not referring to the length of the letter. He's referring to the size of the letters, to put it, you know, in, in other terms. Some think that Paul had poor eyesight, and that's why he says this. You know, he had, he had to write large letters so he could see what he was writing. Remember the strange comment that he made back in chapter 4, verse 15? I'm sure we all remember that. But he said this, Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Well, that's kind of a strange thing to say, isn't it? You loved me, Galatians. You, you would have done anything for me. You would have even pulled out your eyes and given them to me. Well, how is that a show of love? Well, it would be a show of love if you were having eye problems and you could use a new set of eyes. You know, it seems to imply that he had vision problems. And maybe that's what Paul meant here. But A.T. Robertson, the Greek scholar, again, who wrote probably the world's largest Greek grammar, offers another possibility. He points to the difference that is often noted in the papyri, which is plural for papyrus, between, quote, the neat hand of the scribe and the big sprawling hand of the signature, close quote. You know, scribes were professional letter writers. They, they had very precise handwriting, but that wasn't always the case with the author, which is the reason why he hired the secretary to do the work in the first place, to make a, a nice, neat letter. Well, Paul here, as I said, is taking the pen from the secretary, and he is writing this conclusion. And he wanted them to know from the change of the font, so to speak, you know, that 
He is the one doing it because he wants to draw attention to this final paragraph, to emphasize, re-emphasize what, what he has said. So what is it that he wants the Galatians to see? Well, first of all, he wanted to remind them of what was really behind the Judaizers' attempts to bring them under the law. Remember, this whole letter is to expose them, to talk about how if you follow them, it's going to run you into ruin because you're going to fall away from Christ and you're going to fall away from grace if you embrace salvation or justification by the works of the law. He, he's trying to expose this again and give them another reason by showing them why, why the Judaizers are actually doing this. In verse 12, he begins by saying it, it's because they didn't want to be persecuted by the Jews. Verse 12, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Now, you know, the Christianity, you know, which is summarized here by the, the cross of Christ, was a stumbling block to the Jews. A crucified Messiah was a stumbling block to them. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 22 and 23. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block. Hey, the Jews hated the idea of a crucified Messiah. This is one of the reasons why they rejected Christ in the first place, right? They were expecting the Messiah to be a great military, political figure who would take control, as it were, of, of the armies of Israel, lead them to victory against the Romans, restore the kingdom of David, and then rule from Jerusalem forever. They thought he was coming to stay and he was going to be this great ruler. They didn't expect that he would be executed by their enemies by the Romans. So the first thing that the Jews had against the Judaizers was that they accepted Jesus as the Messiah. That was the first stumbling block, and that was one apparently the Judaizers didn't try to overcome. But the Jews found something else very offensive about Christianity, and it was that Moses was no longer needed to be justified, to be accepted by God. Circumcision wasn't necessary. Remember how important circumcision was to the Jews? I mean, if you're circumcised, that's everything. You are in the covenant. You are saved. You know, sadly, there are those who treat the sacraments of the church or the baptism of the church in that same way, and we should obviously avoid that, you know, because that is not what saves us. The Jews thought circumcision is what saved them. But now, with Christ, he's saying circumcision was no longer necessary. So here was a potential second issue that the Jews would have with the Judaizers. Now, Paul is saying in this verse that the Judaizers continue to embrace circumcision and to insist on it for God's acceptance because they wanted to avoid Jewish persecution. You know, if, you, if, if we hold on to circumcision, the Jews are going to think we're still in line with them. Perhaps they thought that if they could convince the Jews that what they were really doing with their work of evangelism was making proselytes to Judaism out of these Gentiles, that they could escape persecution from the Jews. And, you know, let's think about that because these Judaizers were Jewish believers, so to speak, not true believers, but, you know, they, they claimed to trust in Christ, who had embraced Jesus as the Messiah, they had to face their Jewish brethren all the time. It would be hard to be shunned and ostracized by the Jewish community. So they were trying to avoid that. But Paul says their attempt to avoid that has actually voided the gospel of grace. It has been a compromise that destroys it. Again, that's been the argument of his entire letter. If you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. By the way, I think there is a lesson here for us, isn't there? There's always going to be that temptation to compromise, to compromise what Christ calls us to do in order to make life easier for ourselves. Our flesh is always trying to get us to give in in order to escape persecution. You know, maybe, 
to accept unmarried people living together, to accept sexual relationships outside of marriage, maybe to join in inappropriate conversations, to blend in with the world. You know, there's always these temptations to compromise the message in order to fit in so that we can avoid persecution. But the thing is, our Lord tells us to follow Him. We have to be willing to take up our crosses and suffer whatever we must suffer in order to be true to Him. Remember what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what the, all they had to do in order to escape being thrown into the fiery furnace was to bow down to a statue. All Daniel had to do in order to avoid being thrown into the lion's den was to simply stop praying to God for 30 days. I bet you there's a lot of professing Christians who don't do that as a, as a matter of, of practice, you know? Don't pray for 30 days. The apostles, all they had to do was stop preaching Christ and to basically hold their belief in secret, and the Jews would have been fine with that, okay? So if, if they had just made these compromises, life would have been very easy. But, but they couldn't do that. They loved God. They loved the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to honor Him, and because they did honor Him, they, they suffered persecution, but because they suffered persecution, God honored them. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the furnace, but God saved them. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, but he wasn't eaten. And the apostles preached Christ, and God rescued them. The thing is, if we're faithful to God, He will be faithful to us, won't He? He will rescue us if we love Him and seek to honor Him. Now, the second thing Paul says about the Judaizers was that they were hypocrites. He writes, for those who are circumcised, and I believe he's referring here to the Judaizers, do not even keep the law themselves. They say that you should keep it, you should be circumcised, you should keep the law of Moses, but they're not. They're not doing it. Jesus once said to his disciples in Matthew 23, verses 2 and 3, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses, the seat of authority. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, because they have authority to tell you what God's Word says, and when they do that, you should listen to them, but do not do according to their deeds. Don't do what they do, for they say things and do not do them. Okay, well, that's exactly what the Judaizers were doing, and of course, that makes them hypocrites, doesn't it? Well, again, think about the application to us. We need to, to live according to what we believe, you know, practice what we preach. As we tell others what to believe and how they are to live, we need to live consistently with that message. We need to do it openly, don't we? Otherwise, we're going to undermine the truth that we try to bring to others and give people an excuse not to believe. Hypocrisy always destroys the message. And then finally, Paul says this, that they not only wanted to avoid the Jews' persecution, they actually wanted the Jews to praise them. Verse 13, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. And I think the idea here is that by presenting the Galatians to the Jews as full proselytes to Judaism, look, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we are reaching out to them, but, but I want you to notice they're circumcised and they're keeping the law of Moses, you know. So you should really honor us for having made all of these proselytes, you know, all these converts to Judaism. Well, obviously, if the Jews thought that was true, they would not only not persecute, as it were, the, the Judaizers, they would actually honor them. And I think here we see the slippery slope, don't we, of the Judaizers? They first try to avoid the persecution, and it's not long before they want praise. When we try to please the world, it really isn't very long before we're going further seeking after their praise. But if we love the Lord, again, we'll seek His honor and the honor that comes from Him. Now, Paul's point is this. The Judaizers were all about themselves. They were self-centered. They just thought about this world. They thought about how other people thought about them and 
their own prestige. That's all they were concerned about. That's really what John tells us in 1 John, the things of the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. They were after the world, okay? But Paul, on the other hand, was Christ-centered. He was all about him, not, not himself. He was all about Christ. He says in verse 14, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He gloried not in what he did, but in what Jesus did for him, in, in Jesus' obedience for him, in Jesus' death, his cross for him, in the fact that he was raised for him. He boasted in the fact that now that Jesus has ascended and is crowned king and faithfully intercedes for him, that Christ is his hope and not his works. You see, Christ is the hope of every true believer. He is the one the believer boasts in. You know, remember Top Lady's quarrel with Wesley when he saw Wesley giving, giving us some of the glory for our salvation instead of giving all the glory to God? He was jealous for the Lord's glory. Well, Paul was jealous for Christ's glory, and he wanted to direct it all towards him and not take any of it to himself because the Judaizers were all about self, and Paul was all about Christ. Well, Christ needs to be that which we glory in as well, doesn't he? He needs to be the center of our lives. Now, Paul knew that it was Christ who kept him in God's grace. It wasn't his own faithfulness. And we need to realize that same thing. Paul wasn't looking for honor for himself. He says, he implies in, in, in this where he says, I have been, you know, he was glorying the cross of Christ through which he has been crucified to the world and the worlds have been crucified to him. Paul's reflecting here on the idea that he died with Christ on the cross, which is what Paul tells us, of course, in Romans chapter 6. That when Jesus died, we died with him. When he rose from the dead, we rose with him. And now we live not for ourselves, we're dead, but we live for Christ and for his glory. See, that, that is true of every true believer. And again, one of the ways by which we can see in ourselves the Spirit of God at work because this is the way he leads us. Now, while the Judaizers trusted their outward circumcision, Paul went on, goes on to say that he knew that that was only an outward sign of the thing that really mattered, and that is the circumcision of the heart, the new creation that's brought about by the new birth. He says in verse 15, for neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision. It doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised in the flesh, but he says a new creation that is the circumcision of the Holy Spirit that is done inwardly that changes our lives. He knew that it was only those who were circumcised by the Spirit who had the faith of Abraham, who showed that they had that same faith by loving and following the Lord. It's only those who are the true Israel of God, not Abraham's physical descendants. So again, think of the parallelism here. It's not those who are descended, you know, uh, from Abraham through procreation that are circumcised in the flesh, but those who, who have the faith of Abraham who show that they have been circumcised in their hearts by the Holy Spirit who are the true Israel of God. That's what Paul means in verse 16, which is another debated passage in the church. Those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. I want you to notice that and there. It almost sounds like, okay, those of you who are living this way, glorying in Christ and, and living for His glory, peace and mercy be on you, the church. But also on, the, on natural Israel, on, on these you know, unbelieving Jews, because God has a future plan for them. That, that's how this is often understood. But that's not what Paul's saying here. The word and in, you know, where it says, and upon the Israel of God, can be translated in context in other ways. And one of the ways it can be translated is even, okay? Think of it in these terms. Those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them even, 
upon the Israel of God. And what that even does there, it makes the Israel of God a description of those who walk by this rule, who have the faith of Abraham, who have been circumcised, not outwardly but inwardly, by the Holy Spirit. Those who trust Him and who love Him and who follow Him are the true Israel of God. See, that's true of us if we love Him and we're trusting Him and following Him. So we are the true Jews. That's kind of interesting to think about. To, to the natural Jews, we're Gentiles. But to God, we are the true Jews. And they are the ones who are basically <laughs> cast out, but not entirely. We know that God still has, He's still working with them, still gathering His elect from them, even as He is from the Gentiles during this time of the, of the Gentiles, right? So, as I've said, if we trust Him, if we love Him, if we follow Him, we are true Jews. Now, the last question that Paul addresses here is, how strong should that love be? Now, maybe not how, long, how strong is it, because we may not find this kind of love in our hearts that Paul had. We should find that kind of love. We may not find that strength of love. But he does tell us that that love should be strong enough to suffer for him. And I believe that's what he is pointing out in verse 17. From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. So what is Paul talking about here? Does he have the stigmata? Does he have the nail prints in his hands and feet and the, maybe a, a scar on his side? That's what some in the historic church believe, perhaps Paul is referring to here, but we know what he's talking about is the scars that have come from his suffering. If you want to read a catalog of them, read 2 Corinthians where he talks about those things. He suffered a great deal. And maybe Paul's eyesight was poor because of the beatings and the imprisonments and all the harsh treatment and everything he went through. I mean, he was even stoned to death on one occasion, it's believed. And the Lord raised him back again to life. And the first thing he did was not run for the hills, but he ran right back into the city, walked into the city from which the Jews came out that had stoned him. He went back into the city and from there left to go preach Christ somewhere else. He, he just kept on going. But again, he accumulated these scars that came from his love for Christ. And now he calls them the brand marks of Jesus. They are his marks of ownership upon him because they prove his love. It proves that he boasts in the cross of Christ and not in himself because if he was all for himself, then he wouldn't have these scars in the first place. He'd be doing everything he could to avoid them. But that's not what he's doing. He's showing his love by his willingness to suffer. Paul wrote to Timothy just before his execution to remind Timothy of all that he endured for the gospel and to encourage him to do the same. He says in 2 Corinthians 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Okay. Now, that wasn't true only in Paul's day. That is also true in our day. If we trust Jesus for our acceptance with God, if we follow Him, if we want to honor Him and stand up for Him and make Him known, remember what Jesus said. If they hated the Master, they're going to hate His servants. If they, you know, if the teacher is hated, they're going to hate the disciples, okay? Well, we're disciples of Christ. We're going to be hated by the world if we live like Christ. John tells us in his first letter that Cain killed Abel. And why did he kill him? Because Abel loved God and he did what was right, and Cain didn't. So Cain hated him. It's like the, the earliest persecution, isn't it, of, of the church, John then says this in the very next verse, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you, okay? The world is going to hate you in the same way that Cain hated Abel because Abel loved God and did what was right. But the fact is, if, if we love God, we will be willing to take that risk and suffer for the Lord, even if it's just some harsh words. You know, thankfully, we do have law and order in this country, and it's not like it was in Paul's day, you know, where to profess Christ means you're going to get imprisoned 
Sometimes it seems like it's moving that way, and the Lord so far has allowed us still the uh, freedom of speech. But again, if we stand out, there, there are going to be some things that will happen, and we need to be willing, out of love for the Lord, to accept that. Paul then closes with this benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. Now, I think in this case, you know, Paul always closes with a benediction. But I think in this case, what he is doing is he's saying to them, look, I've, I've set before you two different paths. I've, I've described that of the Judaizers, you know, their gospel of works. And I've told you what the truth is, you know, the message that I preach, the gospel of God's free grace. And I have shown you what the end is of, of each of these paths. So now what he's doing is praying that God would give them the grace to reject the Judaizers' path, their works, anything that has to do with them and glorying in their flesh, and to trust in Christ and what he has done and to glory and rejoice in him. And that's really the whole point of the epistle, isn't it? We need to trust in what Jesus Christ has done and in that alone because it is the only way that God will accept us. We also need to understand at the same time the only way that we are ever going to have the power to do what, what God calls us to do, to have that same kind of love that we saw exhibited in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in Daniel, and in, in the disciples, and in Paul, to be willing to go through that suffering is through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the power of His Holy Spirit. And that only comes through the gospel. You know, Donna this morning was listening to uh, R.C. Sproul to talk about his, um, you know, well, R.C. Sproul was dealing with this section in the book of Galatians, and I overheard, you know, I don't like to listen too much to it because I'm thinking if he says something different than what I prepared, it's going to create this crisis. So, so I don't do that. But what I do is... Um, I did happen to hear this, and he said that Luther had written two commentaries on the book of Galatians because of how important it was. So we don't want to, you know, just easily dismiss the ideas that are here. This, this is a very, very important letter. Let's not forget what Paul said. If we turn to works in any degree, then we abandon Christ. And we're not going to find what we're looking for down that path. We have to trust Him and Him alone. And we need to rely upon Him for the power of His Holy Spirit to become what He wants us to become. So may the Lord, again, help us to remember that and to trust in Him on a day-by-day -day basis for our justification and our sanctification. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And as we do, let's, um, let's also pray and ask the Lord to prepare us as we would come to the table this morning.